In the beginning, God, the love of our souls, the source of goodness, truth, and justice, a perfect kingdom of love and light. Until war broke out in heaven through one fallen angel who broke God's perfect law, Lucifer coveted God's throne and authority and deceived one third of the angels to rebel against the Holy One. Since that time, Earth is a war zone where the forces of light and darkness, good and evil, truth and deceit battle it out in a life or death conflict. Are you just a spectator or have you taken sides? Are you living the victorious life God intended for you to have? Let Marla Alona guide you through the truth of God's Word, that you may choose right, that you may have life and have it more abundantly, and that God's truth may bring you eternal life. Welcome to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. In our last episode, we examined archaeological evidence that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. We demonstrated conclusively that Satan's strategy has not changed since he started his rebellion in heaven. Through lies and deceit, he tries to trick you and me into disobeying God's law. Satan will do anything to keep you and me away from God's Word because he knows that the Holy Scriptures would enable us to discern his evil deception and withstand his wiles. Jesus used God's Word to resist Satan's temptation in the desert, a victory that was every bit as key as the victory at Calvary. I like to say that had Jesus not overcome Satan in the desert, there would have been no Calvary. So if Jesus defeated Satan three times, saying, it is written, there is something in those scriptures that you and I also must have in order to win our own spiritual battles. This is why Satan will do everything in his power to prevent us from studying the Bible. In today's program, we'll see how, after centuries of darkness, the Bible finally became available to all men and women in their native languages, and why so many thousands of martyrs throughout history believed that this word was something worth dying for. But the core of today's study is to review the seven characteristics of God's word that make it such a powerful weapon against the enemy of our souls. This is one of my favorite Bible studies to teach because I've had a very personal experience with God's Word and I'll share with you one of those real-life experiences. Everything we'll talk about today is not just theoretical but very real and practical, a solid foundation you can build your life on. We'll end our study today with very useful tips that you can start to apply immediately to put the great power of God's Word to work in your life. Marla discovers the power of the Word of God. Let me share with you how I came to discover the power of God's Word. At the time, it seemed quite fortuitous, but we know that with God there is no such thing. But it was part of a plan that only later was revealed to me. I spent 25 years of my life in France. I went to school there, and I stayed to live and work there. When my spiritual senses started to awaken, I became involved in the New Age and progressively more and more involved until, I, unfortunately, I was very deep into it. When I left France to return to the U.S. two years ago, I was in deep distress over something I could not control. Someday I'll tell you the full story, but for today, suffice it to say that I brought my problem with me to the U.S. The problem was harassing demons, and they were intent on destroying my peace, my sanity, and even my life. Somewhere during that period, I picked up a book called The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. We all know how influential that book has been. What I didn't realize at the time was that Norman Vincent Peale was a Christian pastor and that in his book he uses many verses from Scripture and many of his teachings are, in fact, Bible teachings about faith. The book gave me renewed hope that I'd be able to solve my problem. And I memorized some of these quotations uh, from his book, which at the time I did not know came from the Bible. 
I had no Bible culture whatsoever. I had never picked up a Bible, never opened one. And for many months, um, I had this book, and in the depths of my despair, I would repeat uh, verses from Norman Vincent Peale's book in my mind, or I would read them out loud. I would write them down, not realizing that they were scripture. If I kept my sanity during those very trying months and did not end up getting committed somewhere, I can tell you it was only because of God's grace and the power of his word. In particular, I would repeat these two verses. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. That's from Isaiah 26, 3. And the other one. For God did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. That's 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. I remember driving along the amazingly beautiful landscapes of Seattle and Issaquah in the state of Washington with my dog sitting on the back seat. And I was just seeking to calm my spirit with the peacefulness of nature. And I would just repeat those Bible verses over and over again when things um, would heat up and get really bad. I can tell you the effect of repeating those scriptures was very different from using positive affirmations which are very popular today. I tried um, using positive affirmations in the past. They never did anything for me. And only months later would I come to realize and understand that this was God's word that I had been repeating. So this word has miraculous power. It never returns void and always accomplishes that for which it is sent forth. This is just one example among many of the uh, experiences I've had with Scripture, which is evidence that this is a living word. And if it worked for me, it will also work for you. As we start out today, I want you to feel hope and be encouraged that no matter what your problem is, no matter what dark corner you've worked yourself into, uh, it doesn't matter if the issue is health-related, financial, legal, some important relationship, it doesn't matter. Have faith that with prayer and Scripture and getting closer to God, it will work out, and a higher good will come out of it. Now, before we examine in detail where this power comes from, I want us to have a little bit more context so that we can appreciate how precious it is that we actually um, have this word, that we can go to this word, how it was concealed from the world for a very long time, many centuries, and how it finally became reinstated so that every believer can have access to a Bible. The Dark Ages. As we talk about the history of the church, I want to clarify that I'm not grinding any axes against any particular denomination. As a child, I was raised Catholic. I still have a whole side of my family who are practicing Catholics. God has sheep in every flock. We are all children of the Most High, and He loves in each and every one of His children exactly the same, no matter what church they're currently in. But there are certain things that need to be said about how and why the church hierarchy progressively set itself up as a screen to keep people away from God's written truth. Setting the record straight. In the early days of the Christian Apostolic Church, the scriptures were studied. They were disseminated among believers. This was uh, happening during the first and second centuries after Christ. But in the fourth through sixth centuries, after Christ, a process of doctrinal compromise, which had started in the church, became officialized during the reign of Constantine, the Roman emperor. Um, this happened through the Edict of Milan and the Council of Nicaea in particular. As a result of the changes introduced by Constantine, the papacy became more firmly entrenched and began to introduce new beliefs and practices into the church that were not there in the uh, very century um, in which Jesus died. Um, they were not present in the times of the apostles, and they had no scriptural foundation. I'll give you some examples of some of these beliefs and practices. The observance of Sunday as the day of divine worship in replacement of the Holy Sabbath. The belief in the immortality of the soul, which is a pagan belief. The purchase of indulgences to buy forgiveness from sins, and um, the worship of images, relics, and statues, 
which is strictly forbidden in the Bible. Many pagan holidays also entered into the Catholic religious calendar. As Constantine sought to blend together the two main religions of the Roman Empire at the time that were paganism and Christianity. Now, in order to legitimize its so-called doctrinal infallibility, which is still a basic tenet of the Vatican even to this day, the church hierarchy decided to prohibit the circulation of the Bible. Only the papal power was allowed to possess copies of the scriptures, and people were forbidden to read it or have a Bible in their homes. You could die at the stake. You could be burned for possessing a Bible in those days. The priests positioned themselves as intermediaries between men and God. The papacy, as we already said, claimed infallibility in its edicts and its rulings. So little by little, the papacy continued to institute more and more changes that rested solely on the church's self-proclaimed authority. So the Bible became a very dangerous book because it would allow believers to question some of these changes that the church was instituting, and the Bible would have served as evidence that God never said this. Where is this coming from? So for many centuries, darkness reigned over the Christian world. This is what we call the Dark Ages. People were kept in the dark about God's word. That's what the darkness was about, because light was missing. God's word, uh, which is the light, uh, was withheld. So in the 12th century in southern France, the Vaudois, or in English the Valdenses, had Bible manuscripts, and they stood on God's word to rebel against the Roman power. They had very strong feelings about this, but they suffered terrible persecution. They suffered several bloody massacres that to this day are remembered in French history. Then in the 13th century, um, the Inquisition started. This was a massive persecution of anyone who disputed Rome's ecclesiastical power base. Many people died. Many thousands of people died during the Roman Inquisition. But in the 14th century, an Englishman, John Wycliffe, dared not only to oppose the Vatican's doctrines, but he also stepped out bravely and produced the first translation of the Bible into the English vernacular. The availability of the scriptures now enabled the Great Reformation in the 16th century, which in turn led to the great schism in the church that we know as the Protestant movement that broke off from Rome. Now, I've taken the time to do this very quick overview because in future studies, we'll be coming back to this concept of the mother church, the Catholic church, and the daughter churches, which are the Protestant, uh, different Protestant denominations. This is a very important uh, concept for our end time generation. The book of Revelation refers uh, time and again to the mother uh, church and the daughter churches. This is something we'll be coming back to. I wanted to lay the foundation for you today. But the main point that I want to emphasize from this uh, overview is the following. Across centuries, many thousands of people have died because they wanted to preserve and transmit something precious, something of such great value that it was worth dying for. And you and I are the beneficiaries of that sacrifice. You and I have been handed down the scriptures by these brave men and women who stood on God's word. We have a lot to thank these martyrs for, that you and I today can own and carry and study a Bible. Being able to freely access God's word is one of the most incredible blessings we have. Seven Characteristics of God's Word A lot of you may be like me, having had very little past exposure to the Bible. Maybe you picked one up one day and felt absolutely daunted at the prospect of trying to read such a large volume. Well, the reality is most people in the world today, and even in this country, lack biblical culture and knowledge. So my goal today is to take you on a quick tour of God's Word that you may really start to appreciate the wonders, the treasures, the the precious riches 
that are there. The Lord said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's in Hosea 4, 6. And I find it interesting that there is another scripture that says, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. That's Psalms 107, verse 20. This was one of the scriptures that gave me great hope as I continued to struggle with those tormenting demons that followed me from France and continue to harass me and torment me. You know, the Lord delivered me from all of that. So take courage, because even if you're responsible for your own destruction, and ultimately we always are, I was responsible for my own, you know, this darkness that I brought upon myself. Ultimately, we always are responsible for our own self-destruction. I want you to understand this. Sin is a program of self-destruction that we are all born with. This is very important. That's what sin is. It's a program of self-destruction. But there's hope. The scripture says God sent his word to heal you and me and deliver us from our own destructions. So stay with me as we examine now the seven characteristics of God's word that make it so powerful, so healing, and so transformational. God's word is true and eternal. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. Psalms 119, verses 89 and 90. God's promise to Abraham was that the promised land was for his descendants forever. God's promise to David was that his kingdom would reign forever. So God never forgets his promises. When God speaks something, It's forever. It is forever true. Its validity is forever. It does not expire. It does not become obsolete. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. That's Psalms 119, verses 89 and 90. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. That's also Psalms 119. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Matthew 24, 35. These words of Jesus are recorded in Matthew 24, one of the most prophetic chapters in the Bible. God's word is accurate and detailed. In our last show, we discussed at great length that the Bible is historically accurate, and we provided various pieces of archaeological evidence about this. We're not going to review that evidence today, but let me just mention in passing that many different civilizations and cultures across the world have a flood story of how the earth at one time was flooded with water as divine retribution for human misbehavior. And there are many different accounts also of the creation story. And this is in different tongues and nations, cultures and civilizations. What this tells us is that although other accounts vary significantly in the details of the story, The sheer number of accounts testifies to the fact that there was a creation process and not an evolutionary process, and there was also a flood that covered the earth and destroyed everything to bring a rebirth for both the planet and mankind. Now, what I want to spend more time on today is just talk about the precision, exactness, and excruciating detail that we find in certain Bible passages. Some of these are found in the books of Exodus and Numbers. When God instructs Moses, for example, on the uh, uh, building of the tabernacle, he gives extremely precise indications on how that tabernacle should be built. The the, uh, earthly tabernacle was to be built 
according to the pattern of the heavenly tabernacle. God also gave Moses very specific instructions for the various types of offerings that the children of Israel needed to bring to the tabernacle. There were burnt offerings, grain offerings, drink offerings, and peace offerings. Then the specific offerings might be different uh, depending on the day, such as the Sabbath offerings, the monthly offerings, the Passover offerings, and so forth. I am glad that we don't need to do any of that anymore because of the sacrifice of Jesus that did away with the entire sacrificial system. Also, when Salomon was to build the first temple to the Lord, he received from God detailed and specific indications for the building of the temple. And there is yet one other very good example of detail, and that's when there are very precise genealogies in the Bible. Um, Typically, in Matthew chapter 1, we have the whole genealogy of Jesus that's laid out. Uh, in the Old Testament, we find some uh, longish passages, and they all go uh, according to this pattern, which is so-and-so, who lived for so many years, begat so-and-so, who in turn lived for so many years, who begat so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so on and so on. So what's the point of all this detail? Well, we don't need to memorize or, or you know, um, ponder all the detail of this. But what God wants us to understand is that he is not an approximate God. He is not a good enough God. He's not a God that's into quick and dirty. No, he is a perfect God. He is an all-knowing God. His plans are put in place over millennia. He has a long-term vision. This is a God that knew the end from the beginning. This is a God that can look into eternity. That's the kind of God we serve. He knows and looks after every detail. He knows everything that concerns you. He knows every hair on your head. He sees your heart, and you can hide nothing from him. God's word has power. It never returns void. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. Now this verse, Jeremiah 23, 29, I really like how it's translated in the Amplified Bible. Is not my word like fire that consumes all that cannot endure the test, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks and pieces the rock of most stubborn resistance? Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Psalm 33, 8 through 10. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Joshua 21, 45. God spoke the universe into existence. In the first chapter of the book of Genesis we read, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Then God called into existence the firmament, and the waters, and the dry land, and he continued to create, calling forth the seeds, and grass, and trees, the birds, and fish, and cattle, and the creeping things. And all of this he created by speaking it into existence. In the first book of Genesis, we read a lot, and God said, 
and God said, and God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens, and there were, and so forth until God created man on the sixth day, and on the seventh day he rested. God's words have this power to create. God gave us some of this unique power in that our own words can also create. And we're going to have a full study on that. In Romans 4.17, we read how God calls those things which are not as though they were. This is a distinctive characteristic of the God of heaven, the only real and living God. He is the creator, and he has that creative power. Satan cannot create. So when Satan wants to give someone something, he has to steal it from someone else. He has to steal something that is created because he, has, he does not have that power. And this is why it is written in the Bible that Satan, his only agenda is to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's why he needs to steal. I just want to set the record straight on that one. God's word is prophetic and determines the course of history. History shows us that when God speaks something, it is done. It comes to pass. Now, this is a very big and deep subject in the Bible, and we won't have time today to cover every single prophecy and, uh, you know, uh, study this in detail. And we will certainly do that in, in future studies. But I do want to give you a few historical examples of how Bible prophecy is always fulfilled and how God's word always comes to pass and how God's word and his will actually determines the course of history. Exhibit 1. There are several hundred Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. Jesus fulfilled every single one of those prophecies. I was impressed by the fact that Jesus constantly studied the scriptures. He knew the scriptures by heart. He knew every prophecy about himself. And he made sure that he pointed out to his disciples when he was fulfilling those prophecies to let them know prophecy is being fulfilled before your eyes. One of the most memorable examples of that was when he told the disciples to go take the donkey on which he had been foretold to enter Jerusalem on that triumphant day when hosannas were being sung and praises were being sung, sung to him. Exhibit 2 Egypt was a proud nation with her multiple deities and mystery schools where astrologers and sorcerers perfected their black arts. Egypt constantly vexed the God of heaven. The pharaohs thought themselves to be sons of deities, the son of the Nile, the son of the sun, or the son of the moon. And the pharaohs were often portrayed with the serpent, the eye, and the ankh, which are all satanic symbols. And they all refer back to Satan's deception of Adam and Eve about eternal life. In particular, God wanted to show Pharaoh a lesson, give him a lesson for his continued arrogance against God and his chasing of God's people into the Red Sea. Now, you may remember how early on in the uh, interaction between Moses and Pharaoh, um, remember how Moses threw down his staff, it became a serpent. Pharaoh's sorcerers also threw down their staffs, which also became serpents. So they had some power. Um, they could imitate God's works. But to prove the point, Moses' staff devoured the staffs of the astrologers and soothsayers and magicians of the Pharaoh's court. So God wanted to demonstrate that his power is supreme. He is the sovereign ruler of this universe, and he has absolute power over all of their black arts. In the book of Ezekiel, in chapters 30 and 32, God puts a curse on Egypt. He decrees that she would be slain by the sword of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who would take Egypt, that uh, for the battle, all of Egypt's men, including the Pharaoh, would be scattered abroad, and that Egypt would never rise again to her former glory. It, it all happened exactly as foretold, and to this day, Egypt has never regained her former glory. 
Exhibit 3. There is a great example of how God influenced the course of events, the course of history, in the story of the downfall of Babylon. Babylon was the first world empire. This city emerged from the original Tower of Babel. God's reproach against Babylon went back to those very early days, right after the flood, when sinful and rebellious men tried to build a very high tower that would reach up into the heavens to protect themselves against any future floods that God might send. Um, possibly that God might send to clean the earth again because of their sinfulness. So God had a plan for Babylon. Wherefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will do judgment upon her graven images, and through all her land the wounded shall groan. Though Babylon should mount up to heaven, and though she should fortify the height of her strength, yet from me shall spoilers come unto her, saith the Lord. That's in Jeremiah 51, verses 52 and 53. So God had a plan for Babylon. Because in the same way that he rewards good, he also rewards evil. The story is quite fascinating. And, you know, we won't have time today to go into all the interesting and fascinating detail. But let me just give you the executive summary. In a dream, God warned Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, that his empire would be succeeded by the Medo-Persian Empire. King Nebuchadnezzar rejects the warning. He doesn't uh, want to agree with God on this. He wants his kingdom to be eternal. So he builds a gold statue of himself to be worshipped by all and to proclaim that his kingdom would be forever. This is, uh, for those of you who know the story of the three young Hebrew men, this is where God saves the three young Hebrew men from the fiery furnace because they refuse to worship Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue. So God punishes Nebuchadnezzar for his rebellion. The king loses his mind thinks he's a beast, goes out in the field, lives with the animals for seven years until God restores his sanity, brings him to his knees, brings him to repentance. He admits that, yeah, the God of heaven is truly God. Now his son who succeeded him on the throne was every bit as arrogant as Nebuchadnezzar was until that experience. One evening, his son, uh, whose name was Belshazzar, was hosting a very lavish party for 1,000 of his lords. In the course of the reveling, they desecrated some holy golden vessel vessels that years earlier Nebuchadnezzar had stolen from Salomon's temple in Jerusalem. When he took over Jerusalem, he brought those golden vessels back to his palace in, in Babylon. So that night, Belshazzar wanted to show off his power, please his guests. He offers them drinks uh, in these golden vessels, and they use them to praise their gods. At that point in time, God's hand writes an inscription on the wall. That's where the expression, the writing on the wall, comes from. Daniel, the prophet, comes and interprets the inscription um, to say, uh, you have been found, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom will be destroyed tonight. That very night, Belshazzar is slain. The impregnable city of Babylon is taken without a skirmish. How? Cyrus, king of Persia, had diverted the Euphrates River that flowed into the city that ensured its prosperity. It was a safe city. They had about 20 years worth of uh, food reserves uh, so they could resist any siege. But Cyrus was smarter, so by diverting the, the, the water from the Euphrates River, the riverbed dried up, and he and his men were calmly able to enter through the two gates of Babylon and take the city. Cyrus was an instrument in God's hands to do his will. Cyrus also brought the captive Babylonian Jews back to Jerusalem. He rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, and he rebuilt the temple. Listen to what the scripture says. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. That's in Isaiah 44, 28. So see, God is telling us that he was using Cyrus to perform his will. Now the interesting fact is that all of this has been prophesied well in advance, 
in several Bible chapters, namely Jeremiah 51 and Isaiah 44 and 45. And in fact, in the book of Isaiah, Cyrus is actually named by name. 150 years before he was born, and, and a long time before he became king of Persia, he was named by name to say that he would defeat Babylon, that he would uh, make the river run dry, that he would rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So God has a hand in world history, world events, using whom he will as his instrument to perform his will. Therefore, we need to study carefully God's prophecies for the end time, for it is coming to pass, and it shall surely come to pass exactly as God has foretold it. Let us take to heart Jesus' words in John 13, 19. Now I tell you before it come, so that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. We'll be devoting future shows to uh, prophecy, and uh, I hope that you'll join us for those. God's Word edifies, instructs, and guides His children. The Bible is the main way that God instructs His children. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Of course, when we start to walk with God, and as our spiritual senses start to awaken, as we start to recognize His voice, He will speak to us in other ways as well. But His Word is one very important way for us to know His will for our lives. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. You know, it's interesting that there's a Christian song that's very popular right now. It's a song that I quite love, and uh, it talks about... Um, you know, it's this young singer asking God to show him his will for his life. And every time I hear the song, as much as I like the song, I always think, well, just pick up your Bible. <laughs> pick up your Bible and you're going to see, uh, you're going to get so much guidance and so much clarity on what God wants you to do and wants you to not do. Anyway, not to detract from the beauty of that song. But the Bible does provide us with a wonderful blueprint, a perfect blueprint for a successful life here on earth and a roadmap to make sure that we make it to eternity. If we abide by God's word and we keep his commandments, his word will set us free from all bondage and lead us into eternal life. If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now this Bible verse is extremely powerful, but it's often misquoted because people often focus on you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, but they forget the first part, which says very clearly, if ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And if ye are my disciples, then ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So the only way to get the promise, there's the condition, and this is one important thing to know about God's promises, and we'll talk about that some other time, but God's promises are always conditional. So this promise, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, it has a condition. To know the truth and learn the truth, you have to stay in God's word, you have to abide by his word, and you have to become a disciple of Jesus. God's Word is the sword of the Spirit. Nothing can stand against the Word of God. No matter whether it's some rebellious, resistant demon, doesn't matter if it's Satan himself, no one and nothing, no man, no spirit, can prevail against the Word of God. It is written, 
And God's word gives us the power to overcome the evil one. Get thee behind me, Satan. Remember this. Jesus was also our teacher and our role model. If it worked for him, it will work for us. God's word gives us power over our enemies. The Bible is full of prophecies and promises of how God's children will be protected and will be delivered from their enemies, how God will take vengeance upon our enemies. Psalm 110 says, God will make our enemies our footstool. Matthew 18, 18 says that whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In Luke 10, 19, Jesus tells us, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Through him who loved us, we are more than conquerors. God will set a table before us in the presence of our enemies. If we stand on his words and his promises with faith, we cannot be defeated. For God's word never returns void. A Roadmap for Victorious Living Believe God's word, for he is faithful and his word endures forever. Believe God's word, because his promises are eternal. God told the prophet Ezekiel that none of his words would be prolonged, but the word which he has spoken shall be done. He also told the prophet Jeremiah that he would make haste to perform his word and not tarry. So God's word is something we can stand on. It's a rock-solid foundation we can build our lives on. It's a blueprint for success in this life, and as we already said, it's a roadmap into eternity. It gives us wisdom to make right choices and to anticipate the consequences of our actions. We can use God's word to change our lives, and most importantly, to change ourselves. He wants us to be holy because He is holy. We can use His word to gain victory over Satan and his demons and devils and victory over sin. And we can stay on that straight and narrow path that leads into God's kingdom. We are saved by faith and not by works. And the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There is no other book that can edify us and lead us into salvation like the Bible. Let me repeat that. No other text, no matter how ancient, no matter how supposedly sacred, no other text can lead us into salvation. Not the Zohar, not A Course in Miracles, not the Vedas, not the Nag Hammadi texts, not the uh, Gnostic Gospels, not the Yi King. Only the Bible is God's revealed word that can bring us eternal life. The enemy of our souls is doing everything in his power to confuse our generation. We are the new Tower of Babel. We are constantly distracted with a million doctrines, a million gadgets, a million pastimes, a million apps, and the day-to-day -day busyness. And some people are going to be so busy that they will not be able to schedule eternity into their lives. And their calendar is going to run short. But they don't understand that. Because Satan is doing everything he can to deceive us, to make us stray outside of God's hedge of protection. Satan would deceive even God's elect if that were possible. Don't let that be you. And his greatest deception is yet to come when he will try to impersonate Jesus through the persona of the Antichrist. And against that, against that spiritual warfare, against the enemy of our souls, God's word and the blood of Jesus. Those are our only weapons. The only ground that we can stand on in order to be victorious, to live eternally, and to walk with God all the days of our life. Walk in the only victory that really matters. 
by letting the Lord of heaven and earth win the battle for your soul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God of Israel, Father, we love you. We come before you on this day with humbled hearts, grateful that we have the opportunity to come before the throne of grace, dressed in the robes of righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why we can come boldly before you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that we have been given the opportunity to have your word, to learn your word, to study your word. We are able to claim those prophecies, that we are able to speak those good words over our lives. Thank you, Father, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. Your word have we hidden in our hearts, O Lord, that we might not sin against you. Help us, Father, to be doers of your word and not just hearers of it. Feed us and strengthen us with your word. Give us wisdom. Give us courage. Cleanse and purify our hearts, our tongues, our minds, our bodies. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Strengthen us, Lord, that we may be able to resist temptation when it comes. Father, we want to spend all eternity with you. Help us to stay on that straight and narrow path. Don't let us ever stray. Do whatever it takes, Lord, to bring us back to you, to give us eternal life. And we know that man lives not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Help us, Lord, to work time into our busy schedules to study your word. Father, save us from the craziness of our society, Lord, that we may find time, quality time, Lord, to spend with you, to spend in your word, to spend listening to you, Father, to understand your will for our lives. Thank you, Father, for this promise that they overcame the evil one by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony that every knee must bow of everything in heaven and everything on earth and everything under the earth and everything under the sea and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. Thank you, Father, that you've heard our prayer today for we have prayed in the holy, precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Setting the record straight. And now with the voice of the community, here's Angel Blanchard. Amen. Thank you, Marla. Okay, um, let's say someone is struggling with anger, depression, or some other specific problem, personal problem. How could they use the Bible as a tool, if you will, for combating personal issues? That's a really good question, Angel. Thank you. I'm sure our listeners are wondering about that. Well, I recommend looking up Bible verses that are related to your problem. You can do a Google search, for example. Um, let's say the issue is healing. You could do a Google search for Bible passages about healing or Bible passages about money, if it's a money issue. You can do the same search in your Bible, actually, as many Bibles do have topical indexes in front or in back. Uh, of course, the more... Um, advanced you are as a Bible student, you uh, typically would have a concordance that you could use as well, uh, which exists both um, electronically and, uh, you know, on paper. But once you've done that, then it's really important that you try to understand what God is saying about the issue. For example, if someone is struggling continuously with their health, it would be good to read not only what the Bible says about healing, but what it says about diet and other lifestyle practices. 
if the uh, issue is financial, it would be good to know what God says about tithing and uh, offerings and, uh, you know, investing and so forth. So once you understand God's guidance on whatever the topic is, then start to work with that word. If it's an instruction that God is giving, work with it, you know, open your heart to it, open your mind to it, pray over it. And if you're at the point where you can't, you're not there yet, you can't obey God um, in that particular instance, because it's one of those deep-seated issues that we all have, then just pray over it and ask God to give you the will to will and to do for his good pleasure, which is another scripture. Also, you know, work with the promises. So as you try to comply with his word, abide by his word, also work with the promise, claim the promise. Typically what I do is I write these verses on index cards. I carry them around with me. I'll read them several times a day. I'll pray over them. I'll incorporate them into my prayer. So I'm praying with the word, which is extremely powerful. God said, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. He doesn't need to be reminded of what he said because he has bad memory. But he wants you to come to him and claim his promises for your own life. Also, speak the promises as you prophesy over yourself. Prophesy those good things over yourself, over your family, your the situation that you're concerned about, any dear people in your life, like your spouse and your children, especially as you're going through difficult times in the relationship, it's important to remember to speak those things over all of them and over yourself. Now, there's one more thing that I personally do. I know many people would think this is crazy, and maybe it is, but... I type in large format on my computer, typically in PowerPoint, the scriptures that I'm interested in working with. And then I print them and I hang them on the walls. So if you saw my house, the walls in my kitchen, in my dining room, and in my bedroom are just covered in scripture. It really helps me to have God's word as a resting place for my eyes. And the surprising thing is, or maybe it's not so surprising, that a lot of my visitors, you know, they actually enjoy being surrounded by God's Word. You know, when I have friends over for dinner, um, they just really enjoy that. You know, they sit there while I'm cooking uh, or getting things ready. And, you know, they're just looking and reading all these scriptures on the wall. So I think it's uplifting, and um, it has helped me a lot. Thank you, Marla. Those are some very uh, good pointers, um, ideas. Thank you. For anyone who has never read the Bible, you might feel like I did. This is an old book. What does this have to do with me and my life in the year 2014? Yes, I'm a Christian. I believe in God, but I don't need to read this. I'm fine. You do need to read it. It is a vital part of your relationship with God if you're a Christian to read his word, to understand what he's about. Here's my story. My sister gave me a Bible. I put it on a shelf for a couple of years. Then I started to have some personal problems. I picked it up here and there. Then my life started falling apart and I started studying all of the time and I will never put it down again. If you're just starting out with the Bible, I recommend reading Psalms and Proverbs Read these two books, you will change your mind. And for our listening audience, feel free to contact us if you have any questions or for anything, email us at info at citybiblegroup.com, info at citybiblegroup.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We would love to hear from you. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation.
And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Thank you for listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's truth for this generation. If you've been blessed by this program, we encourage you to share it with others. To ask any question related to this Bible study or any other spiritual matter, email us at info at citybiblegroup.com. To find out more, visit our website at citybiblegroup.com. Hi, I'm Marla Ilana. Thank you so much for studying God's Word with me. Please click on the subscribe button below and you'll be blessed with many more powerful truths for our generation. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready?